Hey guys, this is Nate and this is the Nader Tater channel. Today I'm going to talk about some buying advice and history of the Bobcat Toolcat. This is a 2016 uh, model year that I bought used about a year ago. Um, and in the past I've had two skid steers. Then I grew up on a um, hobby farm with some, um, some tractors. So I have a little bit of experience with some different uh, equipment. I'm not in the construction uh, trade or something like that. So I use this really around my property here. But um, I'll go into detail some things to look for for if you're buying a used one what are common problems and then I'll also go in depth about some of the changes they made throughout the years because a lot of them look the same at first glance but they've actually made some pretty significant changes from back when they came out in like the 2003 time frame till now so let me start with a little bit of the history I have a cheat sheet to help remember and I'll, I'll blast that up here on the screen so you can see it but you know basically in 2003 when they first came out it was the first time they did it it's about a 46 horsepower machine and it had a um, um, live axle in the rear and it did have independent coil up front it had leaf um, suspension in the rear and then you know they, they made some small improvements to that um, after a couple years 2004 2005 they started making a couple changes to the cab uh, design and those machines all had smaller gas tanks so I think they started around like eight or nine gallons uh, and then they got to about 10 gallons and they had both a non-turbo and a turbocharged engine so uh, the turbo engine uh, had a bigger gas tank uh, it actually had a second gas tank uh, up underneath the passenger side and that uh, that gave it uh, basically double the capacity up to about 16 gallons of, um, of diesel so they kept that frame design and the live axle in the rear up until um, the I guess what what people call the the C series so the first series or the A series and the B series and then the C series which the serial number is how you can kind of track that and that's what I'll show on the screen here okay so for the C series the biggest difference that you can tell by looking at it is the boom so the boom on the first generation was a box beam so you know basically looks like a, a rectangular box and then they changed that to a two-piece design so this is what the newer one is it's actually two different um, beams that are then welded together they and it has a different shape additionally to that the attachment up to the um, the quick attach has a different tilt mechanism that gave it a lot more rollback force. so that's the ability for you to roll the bucket backwards so it went from the first generation which only had 670 pounds of rollback force to 2500 pounds of rated rollback force so uh, a significant increase and that was really helpful for picking up heavy loads picking up a pallet um, you know now you actually had enough leverage the downside to it is this new system it, you can't roll back as far so um, at um, at 70 inches high you can only roll back 30 degrees whereas before you could roll back 85 degrees which is uh, more similar to like a skid steer a skid steer you'll be able to really pick up that bucket a lot so that's one drawback to um, to that design but um, really it's more useful uh, to have that rollback force. So then in, um, in 2007 timeframe, they then moved to um, the D series or you know, Bobcat I think really calls it an F series. Um, those are kind of muddy in the water for me as far as what the difference is between the D and the F. But um, they changed uh, engines um, to the uh, a new Kubota engine that's the 56 horsepower turbocharged engine so again that's this is like 2007 time frame uh, where all of them became turbocharged and then um, so they also kept the new two-piece boom and then the other big thing is that they actually sh um, switched the entire frame so that time frame was the biggest change where the frame went more from a typical kind of a pickup truck frame where you have two uh, frame rails that are kind of wide and they had the the uh, leaf rear suspension to where they went to this new spline they call it a spline design uh, so it's really more of a narrow frame that goes front to back and then they have four wheel independent so both front and rear now have um, a arm um, independent suspension um, and that really helps a lot with the ride so the ride significantly improved um, starting with that that D series um, in the 2007 time frame. Now, the other thing that you'll notice that's easy to kind of tell is the fuel tank. So the fuel, the fuel filler tank 
when it went to that spline frame, that's when they moved the tank filler over here to the driver's side. So in my opinion, if, if, I, if I was buying one, and my advice is get one with the gas tank filler on the driver's side, then you know it's the spline frame design. I think there's lots of improvements to, to that. The ride's certainly much better. Uh, the downside is the machines got a lot more expensive then, and so therefore in the used market, um, it's reflected. So you can get the early machines a lot cheaper, um, but you're giving up on some of the, the performance aspects. Also when they did that, that gas tank is now 20 gallons, so significantly bigger. So um, the early ones with the eight or 10 gallons ones, you know, people definitely complain that they can't uh, get a day's work out of them. So 20 gallon, that, that's a big improvement there. And then um, the other big change that happened after that is in 2014. So 2014 is really the, um, the latest, that's a G series. And that's what this one is. Um, and they haven't made a change since then, so I'm, I kind of assume a, a change is coming up um, rel relatively soon here with the Toolcat machines. But on that one in 2014, they went to the uh, all new diesel engine. So that's the, uh, the Dosan engine. It's 61 horsepower rated. They also did things like uh, trash traction controls now available. So the earlier models had um, options for like a locking axle, like a locking rear, rear diff. These newer ones get rid of that and they have a traction control uh, system that independently breaks um, the tires that are slipping to use the torsion type limb to slip to send axle torque um, to the other side. And that works pretty well. And I have a video out there, you can, you can watch that as, as well. But um, let me go into details now of this specific machine and things when you go to go look at one or look at pictures and details of what are some of the common problems. So let's go around and look at some of the things that I've noticed by looking at used Toolcats before I bought this one and reading online. Um, a good form to go to is uh, Tractor by Net. They have a specific Bobcat Toolcat form that has some really uh, helpful um, folks on there and um, you know history that you can search through. But up here is the loader arm I was talking about. They went from the rectangular section to this two beam design. This is something to watch out for. Um, I've, I've heard stories, I haven't seen it myself, but obviously look for any weldment um, to fix any crack issues. Um, especially down here, the end of it is a, this is a cast member that's welded into these, um, these uh, beams. And look for any uh, signs of cracking or damage. That would be, um, you know, indication that this machine was abused. And, you know, with these machines um, having kind of a narrow form there, there's concerns that you could abuse it and potentially tweak or twist these beams. The other thing you can look at is when it um, moves either the bucket or in this case I have a plow on it, make sure as it goes up and down that everything is true to the ground. That would be an easy way to see if those um, loading arms got twisted. So that's something you look for. And then as with any um you know skid steer or tractor machine is check for any play so you know you can lift the bucket off the ground and then just shake the um the quick attach attachment and see if there's any slop in in any of these guys you know side to side it should be tight and not uh, not bang around a lot of these machines are used for municipalities uh, where they have a brush or a plow in the front of them and they have a salter in the back um, so they get a lot of salt in any of these machines, skid steers, tool cats, uh, they will rust and they rust heavily when they're used in a salting environment. So I made sure I did not get one that, that rust, um, or sorry, that has a lot of rust. So here's one, like I said, this is 2016. So now it's four years old and you can see it has some very light surface rust in some areas. You can see the spring has a little bit here, but this is, you know, what I expected it to look like in this. I much prefer original paint than someone to do a paint job. Uh, if someone goes in there and does a quick blast of paint to try to spruce it up, uh, it's not going to last, right? The rust is going to be underneath it still. Um, so, um, you know, that's one thing I look for is up here. Um, you know, this rubber piece is another. Um, this is the rubber stubber that takes the load. Uh, when you put a heavy load on it, The um, all the suspension load goes through these snubbers so make sure those are in good shape that that maybe is an indicator if it's been uh, heavily abused being overloaded a lot you can see that these you know they look almost new uh, but they're four years old and this machine has um, over 2100 hours on it so it's far from new um, that's not uncommon to to get 
a lot of hours you know i was going for 2000 hours or less and that's right where this one was at this one was about $32,500 and like i said at the time so that would have been a three-year-old machine with 2000 hours um, so that they're not cheap but this one i really like because it was in it was in really good shape uh for its age and these things even if they don't have a salter on the back you know if they're towed in the winter time then that salt spray will still get them so obviously look underneath the machine and you can see down here um you know this one had all kind of mud and stuff kicked in here there's definitely um not the best design for not collecting stuff all these things um have grooves in there that collect rock and dirt and if they're not cleaned out it holds moisture and will rust so the most common place i see the rust is the rocker panels so right here you know it's deceiving how high of a step it is so a lot of people accidentally kick this rocker when they get in and then also you can see even me being careful sometimes you'll hit obstacles there and then additionally um, obviously you get spray from the road and driving so these rockers um, do rust and that's what you look for this one actually did have some paint chips and the starter rust so I actually treated that uh, and I'll show a picture here when I bought it it had some visible um, wear it wasn't so much rust but actually just the paint was worn off from rubbing it all the time so that's a place to watch if it you know if they have a rhino liner spray across here or something uh, that's obvious that it um, it maybe had a rust problem uh, to watch out for all right um so then we on this side for the newer machine this is just the ac condenser so um you know that is uh easy to look at to see if there's any um holes or leaks with that definitely prop up the bed that's pretty easy to do you can look underneath it you can see this one i haven't touched any of the bed it does have some scratches there with some rust building so that's on my list of things to do is to go in here and treat that to help it from from continuing what you'll see is just like on mine you get a lot of spray and road debris on this back side and so what that means is this is where the rust is the worst so this is where you can look uh to kind of get an idea this is you know really good um for for these types of machine that's very minimal rust and wear this one obviously had a um a bed liner sprayed in it most of them are just painted white um in there but so check for that the other place you can check is right along the bottom edge of the um the tailgate that one also um you'll see rust on there as well and then the other place that i've seen on the ones that are rusty what I see happen is this rear uh, radiator, which is the main radi radiator for um, all the the coolant and um, you know in the hydraulic system. Basically, um, those fittings will start to rust and corrode and leak. So that's, I mean, you really don't want to buy the rusty ones. Just period, even if they have a new. Um, paint job on the outside and it's because all the fittings and everything are rusted so in here is the engine bay and you can see you know all these fasteners all of these uh these pipes and hoses on this machine are very rust free you know there's very mi um little rust so that's that's things to look for you can um check on any of their filters there's multiple filters in here see if they have um hours or dates written on them for when they did service you can pop open this will cover here this is a good cheat um to, to see if you know they've they've done cosmetic touch up but you know if you can see all the copper windings on the alternator and you can see you know all these fasteners all the paint on the engine still look good then um it's a pretty good indicator that it probably has a um, a decent life and it and then obviously like I said before you know look for filters or service records that they've actually changed the oil changed um, the hydraulic filters and and whatnot most of the the big um, service times are at the 500 hour and the 1000 hour and, you know the, and everything in between is basically greasing the different zerk fittings and doing um, oil changes every once in a while one other thing that I've seen is when they um, when they paint them. Typically, what happens is they paint over all the bolts and the um, the nuts. So, like things like on the actual um, the wheel, those lug nuts. You know, if they repaint them, 
then obviously they paint them orange so um, that's that's an easy way and some of the pictures I looked and I said oh orange lug nuts I know they've, they've been repainting this to try to make it look better and that's not always an indicator that it's a bad thing but it just means that uh, you know you gotta look a little an extra level deep to make sure that uh, they're not just trying to hide something there you know obviously if they're trying to to paint it and spruce it up so it's not faded then um, you know that that could be a win but from all my time there um, that's not the case so up here you can look and verify the model year and the serial number and those are good indicators of um, you know what are the it is the indicator of what series it is that I was talking about earlier so up here you can see this one's AHG so that tells me that it is uh, the latest series it's a G series and then obviously the model year also uh, confirms that and, you know pay attention to the riv um, the rivets on here that they're not something like a bolt um, that, that indicates it's been tampered with and perhaps falsified all right let's hop inside I'll talk about the uh, the cab a little bit so you'll notice on the cab a lot of them have the um, the driver's seat outside corner it's ripped or torn this one had that same thing it had just a small um, area here I went ahead and bought a replacement seat they're, they're not um, they're not that cheap I think if it's through Bobcat itself I think it's 250 or 300 bucks for a new seat this is actually an aftermarket one that's why it doesn't have a Bobcat logo I forget what I paid I think I paid like 170 or so for the replacement seat so just consider that you know it's it is fairly easy to replace uh, it's about 170 bucks to um, to change out the seat itself so um, obviously down here in the rocker this is the area you look for for rust you know you can see that um, you know you can collect water and, and debris in here and um, so th that's a good place to look for for any damage in there make sure the doors shut the doors are very tight um, they have a thick seal so there's kind of a two steps of engagement for latching that's normal but um, you know make sure they're not rubbing um, you know, obviously if there's been any damage to the cab, then the doors might be sagging and they'll be rubbing a little bit. There is no real adjustment on these doors. The hinges are, are welded. So um, that means if they are rubbing, then it's either because something's rusted and the door's expanded or something's bent. Um, so that gives you an indicator of something to, to look higher on. The other things I look for in here is things like the fasteners. You know these bolt heads um they should all match you know if the thing's been taken apart a lot you'll notice that you know the fasteners have marks on them they have wear issues so those are all things i kind of look for let me show you um just how it is to start it up so you should key on this one might be a little bit cold yep so we got a glow plug going so it counts down you can see um after you start it up if there's any um lights on it So it should start up that easy. And then let me lower this down. And right now it's uh, it's about 32 outside, so it's not super cold, but it should start up fine and just idle at about 1300 RPMs until it warms up. All right, so on here on the dash, you can actually uh, press and hold the light button, which is this one right here. And if you press and hold that, for multiple seconds you can see it says none so this um, has no codes that are active to indicate any problems obviously if there is a code that's something you could check and you can then look up um, up here the top right button you press that and that goes through the hours uh, so this is how many hours I now have just under 2200 hours and then um, that's the job hours so that's actually the um, you know that's just like a, a trip and then you have RPMs so um, what I can do here is I can um, show you how to uh, quickly drive it and operate it you have um, your safety lever over here this has to go down and then you can take your shift lever and go up to forward we'll give it a little bit of gas here and then I'll turn on my wipers it's snowing a little bit and then this will be in single speed mode. This does have two speeds to it. And I'll change it 
over here to my speed. So now that's in miles per hour. And if I go full throttle, I'll show you. It should go about eight miles per hour, full throttle, and the pedal all the way down the floor. Now then, on the left side, you can see there's a turtle and a rabbit. You press that button, now a rabbit icon comes on that that's your second speed that should go 17 miles per hour so let's uh get more our full throttle so now we'll just goose it up all right so there you go so all flat ground all pavement it should go about 17 miles per hour, um, and that's a indicator that all that stuff is working correctly. Um, on these newer ones, the traction control light will come on in the two-speed because traction control only works on single speed. So I'll flip that switch, turn off um, the rabbit, and you'll see both on here, it tells you traction control, turn back on, and that light goes away. So that light being off means that traction control is active. You can flip it again, and I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back on and off. Down here, you have your high flow, and then you have a steering uh, indicator for your rear axle and your front axle. So both of the lights on mean that both um, the machine is um, should be going straight ahead. And you know it's, it's pretty regular for them to get slightly off where they don't um, stay perfectly uh, together, but. With those lights are on and that machine's not tracking straight, uh, that tells you that it could be something minor like the sensor. You can relearn actually um, that that steer angle, or it could be that something's bent and and out of alignment. So uh, that's something I, I checked is I make sure I have both those indicators pointed green, then I drive straight forward to make sure that roughly it's going straight. If there's a little bit of an angle, uh, that's okay. So then you can flip this switch here and that will turn on um, two uh, wheel steering, so just the front axle, and then you flip back to here and that will do the four wheel steering. So you can verify that that functions by flipping that switch and making sure that it does two wheel and four wheel steering. All right, so they have a um, engine torque management system so that you can't or you shouldn't be able to overload the engine. And so even at idle, so now it's about 1200 RPM, and I'm in two speed. If I go full throttle and try to lift up the um, this at the same time or something, it should just slow down the machine and it, it, you're not gonna hear the engine groan or, or, or stall and die. So that's a that's an easy way to kind of lug the engine and make sure that that's operating correctly. All right, now for the auxiliary hydraulics, um, even without a attachment on there that runs off hydraulics, you can test it uh, a little bit. You press the hydraulic button, that gives you that light. Um, that light coming on tells you that um, something at least is right, um, that it does have the hydraulics. Here you can see the high flow. So that light came on, so that's another indicator. Um, they have some controls there that that light won't even come on if something's not right. But then the other thing you can do, once you have the aux hydraulics on, even without anything hooked up, if you were to press this lever, um, side to side, you would hear um, a little bit of you know pressure go up to the um, the valves up there, and you'd see it um, move just slightly. That tells you that at least it's sending flow. Uh, obviously, there could be an issue where it is not sending full throw, uh, full flow to it, but um, that's at least checking that all those things are working um, as a valve on and off. All right, my other thing is for lights. I was a little confused by the lights at first. Um, I didn't know if they worked on this machine correctly. Um, and it's because there's two light switches. One is here, and that just um, basically turns on. It says that a light will be on. But which lights turn on is dependent on the second switch. So this second switch here is the one that, um, right now, this means both my rear lights and my front uh, floodlights will be on. This would be just my front flood, um, floodlights in the front. And then this one on the far right, uh, this machine has the driving lights. 
uh, are the road lights, which are um, up here in the front. And some machines don't have, but it has the blinkers and, and the road lights. So that one would have just those on. And there's not a way to have the driving lights on and these upper um, flood lights on at the same time. So that's, that's correct and that's normally how it's supposed to be. So if you have a problem checking out the lights, press this button first. And then you can mess with this switch over here to make sure the lights are on that you won't are on. So one other thing that um, kind of caught me off guard when I first test drove a Toolcat was the steering. Since the steering system is hydraulic, the Toolcat actually puts like a hydraulic brake on when you come to a stop. So even when your safety lever is down, uh, when you come to a full stop and you're not on the throttle pedal or the um, the go pedal at all, the um, the hydraulics lock up and so you actually can't steer um, sometimes when you come all the way to a stop and that's that's normal so um, creep forward a little bit and then you should be able to steer with ease even at a very low speed um, if you're heavily loaded and your rpms are really low you might have heavy steering because of um, you know the higher effort that that's needed uh, to steer so uh, if you're at a reasonable throttle you know 1500 1800 rpm uh, at a stop you should have no problem uh, especially if you're creeping slightly forward with steering uh, all the way to lock if it doesn't do that you might have um, you know some some issue there with the steering uh, system I hope you liked the video if you want to see the toolcat in action doing work both in plowing uh, brush cutting and other activities check out my channel like and subscribe and you'll see more